remove the posterior ligament. When you go for an artificial and you remove the posterior ligament, you have no more restriction and deflection. You fall simply in the kyphotic. So I'm going for the next talk myself. Thank you. So we have heard already a um, fantastic presentation about the artificials, the biomechanics and so on, and a, a very good presentation from Professor Sealy. Thank you very much about all these um, motion preventing uh, system. Um, and um, so we can uh, go through the targets of the surgical therapy. I think there's no question about everybody likes to reconstruct the disci and the low doses. We know that the alignment is much more important than we think about these facts 25 years ago. And we also like to reconstruct the physiological width. We talked about all this yesterday. We do decompression, decompression with stabilization, implants, yes, no, and the functional stabilization of artificial disc implantation. And uh, it is interesting to her, especially from Professor Zilli, that he's doing in many cases uh, decompression without any uh, implantation by an anterior foraminotomy and so on. The gold standard is the bone graft, the bone cement is a little bit less in use, the titanium cage is uh, revival with, uh, with the printer, and the P cage is coded or uncoded. Uh, we are able to use the platement system with titanium cages or P cages, and also an osteoporotic, for example, the uh, very good expandable screw system, especially needful for surgery in the elderly. <coughs> the first artificial was uh, developed more than 25 years ago, the Bristol Cummins as was a metal metal articulation, and they started in 1991. And at the same time, <coughs> the Brian disc was developed. This was uh, uh, another story, because the nucleus was made of polyaton, and uh, the first implantation was 2000 in Belgium. Um, the discussion we had already in the morning is, is there an option to avoid an adjacent level syndrome in the higher or lower levels? The adjacent uh, level syndrome is significant. There is no question about this. There is also an evidence literature about this. Um, um, but on the other hand, we have the question, is there a significance of, of EGO and pseudoarthrosis after, after, after implantation of artificial? And the answer is, unfortunately, yes. This is also, also study proven. And um, in the middle, we have a fusion rate right about 28 percent of all these prostheses in the first three years. Um, indications, um, we think about these. When a patient is already fused after trauma or degenerative, and he is coming out at the next level, so everybody of us thinking about an artificial is the patient is not older than 40, 45 maybe. And this is an example, two years after fusion adjacent bisporus 5-6. This was a prosthesis, prosthesis, full metal prosthesis, and uh, another example, a uh, patient had already a uh, fusion uh, by cage and plating, and two years afterwards, there was a, another sequestration, uh, the level above, and uh, he was asking for an artificial. Also, after trauma, the classical one, bone graft after a trauma, uh, also you have um, adjacent level problems after the bone graft, and this was solved by the brine disc. Um, this problems of subsidence and impact of all these cages, standalone cages, peak versus titanium we talked about yesterday, there is a relatively highly number between very expert surgeons. We had a discussion yesterday as well. Somebody of you has around about 5% in the literature. You'll find incredible numbers of more than 50%. I think this is really a little bit related to the experience of the surgeon, how much he uh, drill bone away, how much he's dis destroying the vertebral body in his discectomy, and uh, is he selecting and choosing the right size of cage. Um, when you're thinking about combination of this, combining a fusion and an artificial, there's only a very low number of this hybrid surgery in the 
cervical spine and ventral approaches. This is uh, just three or four publications until now. Um, this is uh, a story you think about in people in younger age. Uh, in one level, no question, do you need to have a fusion? Your, your findings are there, they have spondylophytes and the hypertrophic ligament. And uh, so you decide for a fusion. This is the classical procedure. There's no question about you all doing this every day. We do this with this uh, Asclep C space. The new generation is uh, peak coated, and they have a much faster uh, ingrow, bony ingrow, than in the um, uh, peak cages. Oh, I don't know what this information is. So um, for the artificial, we did the study with the with the new generation. Well, colleague was asking for new generation. This is the new generation, Synthes Protus Vivo. There is no keel, there's no hammering, there's no chiseling, nothing like this. And uh, you can uh, adjust it very nicely to the intervertebral space. The movements are unchanged to the previous model. And uh, so you have cases like this. Um, young lady, uh, 32 years old, with a double level pathology. And uh, when we remember what we heard in the morning, everybody of you is choosing another way. <laughs> Maybe some of you is going for a double level fusion, the other one only for endoscopic, the other one for double level artificial, or a combination of this. And uh, when you're looking for the thickness of the ligaments and uh, the spondylo uh, situation there, but the main finding of the uh, sequestration. And uh, then uh, you have to realize that in a case like this, uh, more than 50% of the posterior ligament is ruptured. That means this is not stable for an artificial, but you can do this. You can combine it, a fusion, with an artificial. Um, this is another case. She is uh, um, 39 years old, persistent radicular pain syndrome, neck pain as well. This is an unstable situation, and uh, you ask yourself, double level findings, same side. What do you do? You can do everything. You can fuse her, you can put in artificial, but you see the narrowing of the space and the spondylophytes in 6, 7, this is not, from my point of view, this is not more uh, an indication for an artificial. When I remember the presentation from our colleague from India, they put in artificials in much more severe situations. Uh, the law situation and the court situation in Germany is very strong in the moment against artificials. We have a huge amount of problems there. And the indication, you have to be very, very, very careful. That's why in a moment, well, I'm in South Germany, in the surrounding of about 200 kilometers, there's nobody doing a lumbar artificial because of the complication and revisions, and nobody is doing more than one segment cervical artificial. No more double, no more triple. When I have started with my first artificial, this was in 2000, until 2005, we did numerous double and also triple level. We would never do this again. So in a case like this, we're going for that one. Um, the footprint size choice is, is important. No is important no, over destruction. We have heard already this. We put them in a cohort, uh, the peak edge implantation standalone, and uh, for two levels, and on the opposite side, the combination of this, I think the mean age, this is another one, the 30 to 40, and uh, the range grouping, I think this is clear. Um, we have fusion rates in the fused levels, 73%. Uh, in their first three years. Um, and we wonder about the fusion rates in the combined groups a little bit higher. Nobody knows why. Um, sub savings impact more of, well, than, uh, than one millimeter. The standalone group 37 um, and the combined group 25. But the subsidence and impact, this is a radiographical statement. It has nothing to do with the clinical outcome. It has nothing to do with the revision rate. Some impact of your cage you need for the bony ingrow, you will have an impact of 1 to 1.5 millimeters in every case you look and the post-op x-ray. Uh, 
neither uh, fusion or subsidence was related to clinical outcome. And we find for the MACNAP, modified MACNAP, uh, after six months, a little bit superior of the combined. And also after one year, after two years, and after three years as well. Around about 10% more success. This is not so much. This is statistically, statistically significant, but it's not highly. Um, we have, when, when we see this data, we have to think about this is a procedure for young people. We don't know anything about what has happened when these people, this group between 30 and 40, what would happen to them when they're in the age about 50 or 60. This is another story. And the same is the uh, uh, improvement from the baseline. There's a little bit superior of the combined group. Um, facet uh, related problems in the double level fusion group, 45. I think this is no question about this because uh, you have a facet overload. The human body tries to keep his mobility in the same level. He tries to be unlimited, and that means if you fuse two levels, the level above and below have to do more work, and this ends up in a faceted related pain. Uh, sometimes need for uh, facet injections, mostly very successful uh, in rare cases of facet innovation, well, we have already heard about yesterday, and uh, in our in our hands, we're doing the innovation since many years. The maximum uh, of success rate, what you can offer the patient, is around about 35 percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, adjacent level symptoms syndromes in the double fusion group, nine percent. In the other one, 2.5. This is uh, similar to the literature. Um, I want to point out another story we didn't talk about until now. Radiation exposure is, in all this, what we're doing, we're talking about here, endoscopic, cervical implants and so on, is dramatically. Radiation exposure is dramatically. And uh, when you look for the, for the clear numbers, a surgeon who is doing uh, infiltration and up to 20 patients in a week. And he's doing around about 20 spine surgeries in a month. His cancer risk is 20 times higher than in the regular population. And this is you. Your patient is changing every one or two or three hours. You are the same every day. And that's why we're choosing to go in for more and more X-ray radiation uh, protection. And... Um, this is a picture I, I took from the, from the World Spine a few weeks ago, but we have the same, the same machine in, in, in our uh, consultation center for the pain therapy in the OR as well. So this is a complete um, new generation, flat detectors, full digital, and you have a reduction of 50% of your radiation quantity. This is giant, and this is real improvement, and this helps us much more than the next cage generation the next screw generation, the next rod generation. We have to take care for ourselves, and you have to take care for you, because you're responsible for your family, and they need you. And that's why I think about your radiation. Um, the complication rate, this is similar to fusion, some dysphagia, one of uh, 160, just temporarily, no dual perforation. There is a uh, significant advantage.